<laughs> All right. Um, nice eyeball you have back there. Um, where'd you get that one? Uh, the thing uh, I made that myself. Uh huh. Uh, good job. Thank you. Yeah, that's. Uh, I was going to try to not be all fanboy um, during that, but you know, I have it sitting around. Might as well show it off. I might as well, yeah. <laughs> Um, so we have um, usually when we do our episodes. What, what you, oh, okay. I haven't started this yet, so. Okay. Um, I'm just gonna do it and we can do it. Okay. okay. Just make sure we're recording. All right, now we're good. Are both our mics hot? Yeah, we're good. My mic. No, we're not. We're not. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, sorry. All right, we're, we're straightening out it. Here we go. And there we go. Okay. Now we're set. So usually when we do an episode, we have the, a whole little intro part and discussion at the beginning. We're just skipping over all that. We'll do that in post. Um, so I'll just introduce you, and then we'll we'll get into chatting. Sure. Great. Perfect. All right. So, uh, all right. Um, get a little bit of space. So I'd like to welcome a very special guest to our episode today. Uh, we have with us Homer Flynn, president of the Crypto Corporation, the management arm of the residents. How are you doing today? Hi. I'm good. I'm good. It's a um, lovely day in San Francisco. Uh, one this time of the year, one never knows. But uh, yeah, it's quite spectacular out there. Nice. We've got some decent weather here. Um, first of all, I want to thank you very much for taking time out of your schedule to, to chat with us. We really appreciate it. Sure. Yeah. Um, so how is... Uh, How's life in COVID-19 treating you? Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, I, I talk to a lot of people and they seem to mainly fall into two categories. Um, there is the wacky artist types who um, just get to hang out at home and do their wacky shit um, more than they might normally do. And uh, as long as their income is okay, it's not really a problem for them. Um, then, there's, then there's the other people who, unfortunately, one way or another, this is impacted in a significant way. Um, either their income or, uh, you know, I have a daughter uh, who lives in Brooklyn. And um, she had access to a house in upstate New York, in Colacoon, uh, Colacoon, something like that. Anyway, um, that house was empty. It belonged to a friend. So when all this happened, she took, she got her husband and the two kids, and they hauled ass up there, which was a good decision for the most part. But then she's been spending the last six or seven weeks feeling like she's trapped in a house, <laughs> you know, with two small kids that she can't get away from. I mean, there's no school, there's no daycare, there's nothing but, you know, mommy, 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 uh, 24 seven. Uh, so it hadn't been quite as pleasant experience for her. Uh, but once again, it, it kind of falls into different categories. And, and luckily my wife and I, uh, fall into the more, the, you know, the wacky artist, uh, category. So it's been pretty good. And you were uh, originally, uh, the band was supposed to be on tour right now, correct? Yeah, they were. They were. Um, let's see. This was to have started on the 12th, I think. No, the 16th of uh, April. So it would be a little over two weeks into it now. It would be in the, in the second half now. So we're probably around the East Coast. Uh, but, um, you know, it, it, on one hand, it's too bad it didn't happen. On the other hand, it has been completely rescheduled. Um, and now the exact same tour is happening in uh, one year and two weeks later. It will start in late April of 2021. So, assuming that we're all alive uh, <laughs> and, and not in such a crazy state at that time, well, it will, it will happen then. Excellent. I have to admit I'm, I'm excited about, I mean, disappointed that the tour was postponed, but uh, I've seen every tour since Icky Flicks, and this was the first one. I had an engagement the same night as the show, 
Um, so I wasn't going to be able to make it. So mm. now with it being next year, there's a possibility I'll be able to make your Boston shows. Yeah, cool. I'm excited cool. about that. Um, so uh, one of the things that we, we do on this podcast and uh, how we got around to, to having Homer on here tonight, um, we like to, um, I wouldn't necessarily say review, but more discuss um, esoteric and offbeat albums. So rather than bringing one of our own to the table, uh, we asked you uh, what your favorite esoteric right. album was. And you shared with us um, Frank and Clyde. Um, Frank and Clyde, indeed. And now that you mention it, um, I actually have a, a copy of it over here so I can show you the cover. Just a second. Oh, okay. And so here we are, uh, Frank and Clyde. Nice, the music you've asked for. And I have to say, originally, this was not so much of a personal favorite. Uh, honestly, I'd never heard of them. Um, but the residents were so enamored with Frank and Clyde, and they had had periods where they just played it all the time. I think they even used it one time as walk-in music or walk-out music on one of their tours. Uh, Demon Dance just Alone. Love. Huh? Demon Dance Alone tour. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so um, once again, I kind of I kind of picked it up um, off of them. Um, you know, on one hand, it couldn't be any more cornball. Um, you know, it's two guys who had this act that they do uh, playing lounges in uh, Indiana. You know, back in the Oh, I guess probably the 60s, uh, maybe early, maybe as far as early 70s, I'm not sure. Um, but there's just a certain, I, I don't know, for, for want of a better word, a certain heart to it um, that, uh, that to me really comes through. And even though the music is corny and they're not the greatest musicians in the world, they, there's something that they, that they bring to it uh, that really grabbed me as well as it did the residents. And, you know, I, th I think, I think what the residents felt like they saw in Frank and Clyde, um, was kindred spirits. Um, once again, not certainly not on a superficial level, but, but below that, you know, um, and so anyway, it, it, it always kind of resonated, no pun intended, uh, with them and then consequently with me too. Yeah, it's definitely got a playfulness of it um, in it that reminds me of especially early residence work. Yeah, there's definitely some stuff. Um, you, you mentioned that, and I went back and checked, and there's definitely some stuff in Meet the Residents where I can hear, you know, e echoes of Frank and Clyde. Mm -hmm. And I believe... Um, on the Charles Bobuck um, album, uh, there's a like a 30 minute cover. I wouldn't say a cover, but Maxine is sampled in the background of one of the tracks. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, there used to be a record store in San Francisco called the Record House, and uh, it was a pretty good record store. Well, once a year they would have these gigantic mega sales. And if you went into the basement of the record house, there were bins where you could find records two for a quarter. Mm -hmm. um, and the record uh, residents, the residents lived for these sales. And, you know, they would, they would come with huge stacks of records uh, away from that sale. And, that's, that's where they found Frank and Clyde. Uh, and I mean, they would buy things just because they liked the cover. And I think initially that's what attracted them to Frank and Clyde. It's like, oh boy, now that's a cover. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I, anyway, I think, I think that's how they originally connected with it. 
You can definitely see that. I know uh, in, in listening to it the last couple of days um, that um, the track Maxine especially is just, it's an earworm. I get it stuck in my head, which is a good yeah. thing. Yeah. 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 And I think it's really cool too. It's, it's got this like 30s, 40s kind of vibe. I'll say to it. Yeah. Is. Um, but it didn't come out till the 60s. So it's kind of like a callback to it. To, uh, the time yeah you know I I don't know anything at all about these guys but I just you had this feeling that you know they probably both played in big bands um, you know toil the way in obscurity and and at some point they just connected and became buddies and you know rather than playing you know endless repetitions of the Dorsey brothers or uh, you know, uh, other popular big band stuff. They just said, okay, well, you know, hey, we're just going to bring it all down to just the two of us and see what we can do and have fun. Um, that, that's what it feels like to me anyway. Yeah, and it, it, I, I find it funny that you mentioned um, that sort of uh, earnestness that they have in the music. Because I've said a number of times on the podcast when I've made Aaron listen to music that is nearly unlistenable, one of the things that I love in, in sometimes in bad music is that heartfelt earnestness that people put into it. Yeah, there's a sense of commitment to it, you know, and uh, and that, that that counts for a lot. Mm -hmm. I'd rather hear that than somebody's overproduced um, whatever. Sure. Yeah. I saw, um, so I, do you have a favorite track off the album or is it just sort of a background? Um. You know, I, I don't really know that. I, I mean, I like I actually like Maxine quite a bit myself. Um, and I think there's in there one called Diane. Uh, yeah, Midley, Diane Charmaine. Right. Yeah. Um, my ex-wife, uh, the mother of my daughter that's upstate in Calicoon, um, her name was Diane. And uh, so I always kind of thought about her uh, when that one came up. But but Maxine is really good too. It's definitely catchy. Yeah. Um, so I would be remiss <laughs> if we didn't ask a few um, questions about the residents, um, if you don't mind, or what you got going on currently. Um, I didn't want to spill any beans, but you mentioned you got caught up uh, with the music video the other day. Um, right. Anything you care to share or is that? Um, well, the residents have a new album that will be released on July the 10th. And the name of the album is Metal, Meat and Bone, um, The Songs of Dying Dog. And this all spins around um i don't know have you seen um the theory of obscurity film the the, the residence documentary theory of obscurity yes well if you remember in the beginning of that or near the beginning there's a guy an older guy who's sitting playing a hammond organ kind of in a cabin off in the woods uh somewhere and um, this is a guy named Roland Sheehan. And Roland was, was instrumental in the formation of the residents. Um, Roland had a band that he uh, played in uh, in high school uh, back in the uh, mid 60s, I guess. Uh, late, mid to late 60s and and Hardy Fox was actually the manager of that band and um, so I'm kind of drifting off a little bit here but uh, but ultimately Roland brought it one the residents really wanted to do for a long time some kind of album about or around the idea of, of blues it's like they grew up with, listening to a lot of blues. They loved it, but they never really found the right hook for it. Um, they just didn't want to just do covers of, you know, uh, Howling Wolf or 
BB King or, you know, or, or, or whatever. And they kind of tossed the idea around for a long time. At one point they were talking to Roland Sheehan about it. And Roland went to them and said, hey, you know, actually there was a guy uh, named Alvin Snow. And I was like Alvin's band leader, you know, back in the late, late 60s, early mid 70s. And, uh, and, and what he said was that they, they recorded several demos of Alvin um, and were getting ready for the band to play their first gig when all of a sudden he disappeared. And, um, and he volunteered to let the residents hear these demos of, uh, of, of Alvin Snow. Um, and, you know, at first they were kind of, yeah, 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 that sounds okay. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> world's full of demos. Um, but anyway, they did listen to um, Alvin, who, who ultimately was going under the name of, of the blues name of Dying Dog. And, and they loved it. They absolutely loved it. And so they ultimately decided to do an album that has all the same songs on it twice. And, and so the album has all of the original Dying Dog demos on it. And then it has the residents doing their versions of the same songs. Oh, and then they wrote another half dozen songs that were inspired by it. So, um, so ultimately, that comes out, like that's the album that comes out in July. The first single comes out next Friday, the 15th. And uh, the name of the song is Die, Die, Die. Um, you know, the, you know um, Eric Fellman, um, you know, Eric played with Captain Beefheart. Uh, uh, he's played with the Pixies. Uh, he was Snake Fingers band leader. Um, and, and Eric, ever since Hardy Fox passed away, um, Eric has been the resident's producer. Um, well, it turns out that he and Charles Black, Black Francis from uh, the Pixies, are good friends. So they were looking for some additional vocalists uh, for this, their versions of the Dying Dog songs. And so uh, they got Charles to do the lead vocal on the Die, Die, Die song, which turned out to be pretty spectacular. Oh, wow. uh, so that's the first single. And it comes out next Friday. And that's what I was doing the music video for. Oh, wow. I, was, I, was, I was working. So th that will have its premiere. I'm not sure yet where it's going to be premiered, but that will be premiered next Friday the 15th. Excellent. Mm. Actually, before our episode comes out, so <laughs> we're not spilling the beans on anything. Yeah. We're recording three weeks ahead of time. So. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Nice. And then the, uh, so the 2021 tour is in support of um, mostly that album. Right. Right. It's mostly that album, although they're going to do uh, an extended encore of uh, material from Duck Stab. So uh, the name of the tour is uh, Dog Stab, which is your combination of Dying Dog and Duck Stab. Nice. That'll be, uh, uh, I'll be looking forward to catching that. It's, um, that's one of their more fun albums. Um, I, I was thinking about that um, recently. Well, well, contemplating the the various tours I've seen over the years and I know all of us are getting older and the last few tours seem to have been you know preoccupation with the aging process and and death um Duck Stab's a fun album so it'd be kind of exciting to hear that again not that I don't like the newer stuff yeah I mean it's certainly a fan favorite yeah it's certainly a fan favorite and, um, you, you know, you, everybody always likes the older stuff better. I mean, after some period of time, well, they may actually grow to like the newer stuff. But 
um, they kind of felt like, well, okay, they, if, if they're going to make people have to sit through all, all this new stuff, <laughs> then they'll give them a little treat, you know, <laughs> which is an a extended uh, Don, uh, duck stab encore. Yeah. Oh, it's an interesting evolution. Um, you know, it, it's funny. When I first became introduced to the residents, it was um, – I was, somebody had found out that I like Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds, and they said, well, if you like Nick Cave, you'll like the residents. It took me a long time to figure out how those two are connected. Um, but watching his career over the last 20 years, there's been a real maturity and a change in the direction of, of sound, and it's it may not be that fun fan favorite stuff, but the music has got much more depth and resonance. Um, and I, I think the same is true with the residents, no pun intended. Yeah, 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 it may not be as more playful as playful, but there's definitely a lot more there, and uh, it appreciates over time. Um, I think so. Yeah, I think so. Any um, plans beyond um, dog stab at this point, or I know things are usually pretty nebulous with the band. Well, the um, the other thing of well, there are a couple of other things of, of significance. One is that um, you know the residents just recently performed their um, "God in Three Persons" album um, at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, um, and you know f for them, you know, there's a huge long list of, of projects over the years. Uh, a lot of which could have been developed further than just a music album. And they always said the top of that list was God in Three Persons. And, and um, so to actually have that come come to light at the Museum of Modern Art was, was pretty satisfying for them. But uh, there's, there's a lot of conversations going on about taking that further. Um, there is a really nice... Um, do you know what, what the Presidio is in San Francisco? Yes. Uh, you know, it's, it, it's an old army base uh, for like 400 years or something like that, several hundred years. You know, the most pristine piece of real estate in San Francisco, the very tip end of the peninsula uh, that the Golden Gate Bridge leaves from uh, was owned by the U.S. Army. Uh, but about, I don't know, 15 years ago, something like that, uh, the Army gave it back to San Francisco. Um, and now uh, it's, it's actually, a, like I say, a, it's almost like it's a park or something. It's, it's such a nice piece of real estate. But um, the Presidio Theater was an old movie theater there that was built in the 20s or 30s and it kind of fallen into disrepair and nobody was really doing anything with it. And then uh, one of, some woman, I don't, I don't know her name, uh, who was one of the mega gazillionaire uh, Levi's heirs, just decided to put $40 million into restoring that theater. And it is now a spectacular facility. And um, falling into the sometimes you get lucky category, um, the guy who is the artistic director of the Presidio Theater was the um, director of a small theater uh, in San Francisco uh, when the residents were doing their QB show 30 years ago. And uh, so now he, he uh, it was called the Cowell Theater. And so he left the Cowell Theater. He went to Santa Fe, New Mexico. He ran a small theater there for 15 years or so. And then about two or three years ago, he came back, and now he's running the Presidio Theater. So uh, assuming we can escape the plague, uh, there's a nice conversation going on about doing a small run of God and Three Persons at the Presidio. Um, and then it would be really nice to get it to Europe and just see where else it could go. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, that's one thing that is in the works. Um, also, too, the residents have been working on a film project for the past two or three years um, called Double Trouble. And um, Double Trouble, in a way, was kind of like revisiting 
um, a lot of the same ideas and aesthetics, but in a different context of their violence fats film project from the early seventies. Um, so now that they have an opening in their schedule, um, coming up, they're really trying to, well, they, we, me working with them, uh, are really trying to start pushing the energy in that direction and hopefully start actually shooting some stuff in the fall, but, but we'll see. But that's, that's about to become a big push. Nice. Are um, you giving any thoughts to, to doing a crowdsourcing with that as well? That seemed to be pretty successful with the last few outings. Um, it's possible. Um, you, you know, the biggest problem with doing something like that, as, as almost anybody will tell you, is, is the money. And um, we, have, we have found some backing, but not enough to be able to do the film as it is currently scripted. And so what's happening is the residents are giving a pretty drastic rethink towards how to do it. Um, and hopefully to be able to then come up with a new screenplay that will let, essentially let it happen with, with the money that we have at this point with the support we have maybe plus uh, some additional support from uh, crowdfunding. Um, so we'll see, we'll see, but th that's, uh, it's being talked about. I just remember, uh, was it was a number of years ago at the, with the bunny boy um, videos after that series was a lot of the, the set dressings were auctioned off on eBay. And uh, right. I remember right. being a fan, I was excited. I'm like, oh, I can get a, a piece of this. And, and the crazy amount of money every piece went for was, it was staggering. You get some yeah. rabid fans. <laughs> um, you know, the residence fans are not, there's not millions and millions of them, but the ones that are there, the, the thousands, tens of thousands that are there are extremely, um, committed and supportive and that's and that's great that's a good thing yeah hey committed for sure i've heard my wife use that term a few times with me and the residents <laughs> or should be committed is probably what she was saying yeah well I, uh, there's that side too excellent well i don't want to uh keep you too long um so thank you uh very very much for for taking sure. some time to to talk to two small podcasters from the East Coast. Uh, we appreciate it. No, my pleasure. My pleasure. And uh, I'm hoping to catch the, the band when um, when you're here. I, I presume you'll be on the road with them. Um, I, I will be on the road with them, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, okay. we're, we're, short, we're south of Boston, so uh, maybe I'll give you a shout-out when, uh, when you're in town. Um, yeah, do. Do. That'd be great. That'd be great. All right, well, um, stay safe. I hope you and your family all uh, weather this um, crazy pandemic. And well, so far, so, so far, so good. Uh, if it doesn't get any worse than this, you know, we'll be just fine. So we'll see. Excellent. Well, thank you again. Um, oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Okay. And, uh, all take right. care. Take care. Yeah. Bye bye.
Folks are getting so they call me silly. I'm as loony as a tune. 